Well, before we dive into the word here, let's, uh, let's just pray uh, and ask for God's blessing upon this time. Father, we just come to you, Lord, with expectant hearts, with ready hearts, Father God, ready to receive your word today, because your word is alive and it is powerful. It accomplishes exactly what it is sent out to do, because you, Father God, are the one watching over your word to perform it. So, Father, we ready our hearts to receive your word. We receive your word, Father God, with humility with gratitude and with expectation, knowing that, Father, that this word is going to take root within us and produce a hundredfold crop in our lives. Father, I lift up myself to you, Lord Jesus, uh, and I ask, Father, that every word I speak would be directly from you, Holy Spirit. We ask for your presence here today, Holy Spirit, that you would move and have your way, Father God. Whatever you desire to accomplish here, desire, uh, we, uh, we pray that it is accomplished here today, Father. Not our will be done, but yours, Father. We thank you when we praise you, Father God, for your will being accomplished here this morning and in our lives as we leave here today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So last week we kicked off this series, uh, Where Your Heart Is, uh, you know, a series where it says a series on financial stewardship. So we're going to get to the stewardship part uh, really next week. But Pastor Josh said this on Monday, and it's funny about it because that's how I saw this series. Last week, we really tore down some strongholds, you know, in lies that the enemy tries to get us to believe as believers, uh, you know, in regarding finances. But we had to really tear those down because sometimes you can't build upon something unless something else is torn down. Amen? Like, you see it all the time. Like, well, they want to build a new building? Well, guess what? They got to tear down the old building. Thank you so much for the water. Uh, and they tear it down, and they build up a new one, a better one, right? So this is what we did last week. So we learned very clearly through the scriptures that it is God's desire, and Pastor Josh hit it again today, that it is God's desire for his children to prosper, okay? But this week, I wanted to really look at, a, for us to self-reflect and really look at the views that we have about money and our motives regarding this prosperity and regarding finances. Because what we have to do is we have to level the thing that was built there before that didn't need to be there. And now to build that foundation, the foundation starts in your heart. So what is our motivating factor behind all of this? Well, let's go over here to 2 Corinthians uh, 8 and 9. Uh, Pastor Jessica talked about this in prayer this morning. Uh, Pastor Josh talked about this last week. But this is a, a wonderful verse here. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, it really sums up everything we talked about last week with God's desire for us to prosper. Let's see here. Flipping left-handed is not the most fun. There we go. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 says this. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Now the Greek word here for rich means wealthy or abounding in resources. So we can see it's not rich like in spiritual things. It literally means finances, right? We can see it's very clearly talking about provision. Rich talks about provision, okay? So my question when I read this verse is, when was Jesus poor, right? Because I think sometimes we get, we get a picture that people paint for us that Jesus walked this life this, on this earth as a lowly man, not having anything, right? But does the scriptures really say that? Do they really say that? So let's look into so what the scriptures say. Look at Luke chapter 8, verses 1 and 3, or 1 through 3, I should say. Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Because we got to really see what the Bible says about things and not just what someone said the Bible says about something. Amen? Because a lot of times we just go, oh, I, someone told me this. Well, look it up yourself. That's why I'm going to the scripture here. I'm not, this is not anything I made up. This is not anything I wrote. This is what God said, right? Verse 1. Now it came to pass afterward that he, which is Jesus, went through every city and village preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. And certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, look at this, who provided for him from their substance. Very clearly here we can see that Jesus had ministry partners, right? It says he went about preaching the kingdom of God. And, and I also want to point out, he says that the twelve were with him. Do you know it takes finances for someone to be on the road in their ministry for three years, nonstop, and not to support only him, because he, he never needed anything, because he had everything through these, provision, these uh, ministry partners, but it also supported the other 12 people who were with him. So really, 13 people traveling for three years, that takes money. It wasn't like they were homeless and begging for scraps and stuff like that. They had provision. 
And if you read throughout the entire Gospels, for time's sake, we're clearly not gonna do that, but there's not a single account in there where Jesus or the disciples lacked anything. Not one time was it like, hey, they wanted to do this, but they couldn't because they didn't have enough. Never, never, never did it say that, or does it say that. And look at, and we can see a great example of that, Matthew chapter 17, verses 24 through 27. This is, a, this is just an amazing uh, picture here uh, of provision from God, and it is wild at the same time, and that's, I love it. Verse 24, when they had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the temple tax? He said, yes. And when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him saying, what do you think, Simon? For whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes from their sons or from strangers? Peter said to him, well, from strangers. Jesus said, then the sons are free. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first. And when you have opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and you. Crazy, right? He needed to pay the temple tax. He didn't want to offend them. So he's like, we'll just do it to not offend these people. And he goes, all right, so here it is. Uh, I might not have it on me right now, but I know exactly where it is. In that sea over there, cast in a hook, you're going to pull up a fish, open a fish's mouth, you're going to find the money in there, right? Jesus maybe didn't have it on him as a person, but he had the resources, right? Because God's miracle power worked to provide for their material need. Let me say that one more time. God's miracle power worked to provide for their miracle need, okay? And this is just one example of this. You can see this in the feeding of the 5,000. And guess what? There was another feeding of 4,000. And those were just men, not counting women and children. So Jesus multiplied these things. They had provision, but what it looked like in the natural didn't seem to be enough, but there was always more than enough. Because in both of those feedings, it says in the, the, the one with the, the 5,000, they picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. And then when he fed the 4,000, they had seven baskets of leftovers because our God does exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to the power that works in us, right? Also, I want to point out in those feedings, I don't even have this in my notes, that Jesus broke it, right, blessed the food, and then handed it to the disciples. Where did the multiplication happen? It happened in the disciples' hands, not in Jesus' hands, because the disciples were the ones handing out the food. Could you imagine that? They just keep handing it out, and the basket just keeps being full, keeps being full, right? They never lacked it. They never... And, but what's amazing about this is Jesus really tested them in these things because they came to Jesus and they said, hey, look at all these people. They're gonna, they need to eat. What are we going to do? And he goes to them, you feed them. That was his response. But if you look at this in Luke uh, chapter, I think it's 11, in Luke chapter 10, he had sent them out to cast out demons, right? And they were elated. They came back to him like, even the demons obey us in your name, right? So now he's going, okay, well, can you, you trust me in that one? Can you trust God in this one? Can you trust God in the provision realm, right? Because he looked to them, he said, you feed them. And they're like, we don't have enough faith. And Jesus said, okay, well, guess what? I guess I'll have to step up and do this thing, right? So he did that. But he always had enough resources to meet his every need in his ministry and more to give unto people, okay? He didn't lack anything. We can see it. Look at this in John chapter 12. And this is the one that I think is gonna, oh my gosh, John chapter 12. Let's just go there. It's so good. I told this to my wife, and she was like, I've never seen that before. And I said, neither have I. That's why this is good. John 12. Praise the Lord. John 12, verse 1, says this. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper. And Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Then he, or this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. Let's just pause there for a second. If Jesus was poor in his earthly ministry, why does he have a money box? Like this is, read the scriptures, right? Why would someone who's a thief hang around with someone who's poor? If you're a thief, you steal things, right? You take stuff, you take from people who have things. You don't take from poor people. They don't have anything to take. So this is right. So just let's use our human brain here. We can do this. It's, it's clearly, Jesus had a money box because he had money, right? 
continuing on, verse 7. But Jesus said, let her alone that she has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not always have. So I want to point out this. Jesus was not intimidated or concerned or uncomfortable with the cost of this oil. If you look it up, this oil would have cost a year's salary, a year's wages, right? So let's just, what's, I don't know what the average salary in the U.S. is. Say it's, say it's $40,000, it didn't intimidate him that someone was giving him a $40,000 offering. He didn't go, no, 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 that's way too much. You could never, that's, no, 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 don't, don't, don't. No, he just said, let her do it, right? Let her do it. And also I want to point out here in verse 7, or verse 8 says, For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. Jesus clearly distinguished himself from the poor. Right? Isn't that what he said there? Hey, the poor you have with you always, but me you don't always have. So these are the things that I want us to like really think about. Like it was Jesus walking around, wandering this. And I'm, just for time's sake, I'm not going to go here. But at, at the crucifixion, it says that the, the, the soldiers who crucified Jesus, they divided up his clothes and gave them to the four of them. And it says that they gambled for his tunic. Now, I'm not sure about you, but I don't have nice enough clothes where if I died, someone's going to gamble for him. That's for sure. He had nice stuff. He had these things. Now, so we can clearly see in, that Jesus, or like it says in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, right? He was made poor that you might become rich, right? Also, he was, it's, hold on, let's go there. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Can you put it up on the screen, please? Because we're going to walk through that verse a little bit. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. See, we got to look at wording here in the Bible. It's very important. He became poor. Done deal, right? Was a done deal. That you, through his poverty, became rich? Might become rich. I talked about this last week. There's a responsibility on our part. Just because Jesus did something doesn't mean it's automatic, okay? It doesn't mean it's automatic. It's available, but it's not automatic, okay? So, when did Jesus do this? When did he become poor? Because we can see through the scriptures in his earthly ministry, he wasn't a poor person. He was a prosperous man. Now, prosperous, we got to get out of our minds, doesn't mean an extravagant lifestyle. He didn't have a mansion and all these things. But he always had enough for him, enough for his disciples, and more for, to carry out the call of God upon his life. He didn't lack those things. That's the definition of poverty. You don't have enough to do what you're called to do, right? Right? God's not about that. God's about prosperity. Like that prosperity is having enough to do what God has called you to do. Amen? That's what we got it because we think in our, because we live in the United States of America, right? So our prosperity, we think mansions and cars and like silly stuff, like oh, whatever. It's not about this stuff. Who cares about any of that stuff anyways? It's about having more than enough to do what you're called to do. You don't, you don't worry about money. You don't go to sleep thinking about how am I going to eat the next day. These are the things that the, the Gentiles seek after. But so Jesus really became poor on the cross, right? Galatians 3.13, we know this verse. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, curses everyone who hangs on a tree, right? And then it even goes into Genesis, or sorry, not Genesis, Galatians 3.14. This is that the blessing of Abraham, once again, it says, might come upon the Gentiles, right? So it's a responsibility we have to be able to receive and use these things. So this is why we teach this in church, this isn't just why, nothing of God is really automatic. Salvation's not even automatic. It takes cooperation on your end to receive it, right? Did he do it? Yes. Does everyone get it? No. Did he, did he become poor? That's what 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 says. He did. But do you receive it automatically? Nope. You need to work at it. You need to, you need to see what the scriptures say on it. Because, and I want to point out, God was just speaking to me this morning. Because Jesus became poor on the cross, means it's a done deal, right? Because he became sin on the cross, that was done away with. He became sickness and disease on the cross, that was done away with. So because he became poverty on the cross and lack on the cross, that was done away with. It's up to us to step into it. Because if we look at it like, oh, he, he just walked through life as a poor man, and then he gave his life so we could be saved from our sins. We're missing a third of what the gospel says. Because really what Jesus did on the cross was he freed us from spiritual death, poverty and or poverty and lack and sickness and disease he took all care of all three of those because those all fall into the line of death right those are the realm of death the, the ministry of death so he took all of that and gave it all back to the church saying no you're going to have life and life abundantly right 
Because God doesn't want to take things from you. That's what the devil wants to do. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, right? So if something's taking something away from you, that's a bad thing. But sometimes we think, oh, no, God wants it, doesn't want us to have these things. No, he doesn't want things having you, but he doesn't mind you having things. It's not about that. He doesn't even care about that. That's, that's extra stuff. And this is like, so uh, let's not get ahead of this. So I get all over the place at times, but why, why did Jesus do this? Why would he become poor so that we become rich so we could just have a bunch of things and go look at how great God has treated me? No, you can use those things to minister to people and show how good God is, but that's not the main purpose. The main purpose Jesus did this was to set you free, to set you free. Because John eight thirty six, and many of us know this, says, therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed, right? So you see, God loves you so much that he wants you to be free from everything, every aspect, anything that could try to pull your attention. He wants you to be free from that. Exodus 20, verse 3, and this is the start of the Ten Commandments. First commandment, right? You shall have no other God before me. You shall have no other God before me. Because he doesn't want you to obey anything but him. He doesn't want you to bow down to anything but him, Okay? But when we do this, sometimes we don't, we don't think about this. Yes, I have gotten in the position of God. Yes, but how often do we listen to fear? How, also, how often do we listen to shame? How often do we listen to guilt? How often do we listen to sickness and disease? How often do we listen to lack or poverty, right? And then determine what we can do based upon those things. It's the exact same thing that the disciples did with the feeding of the 4,000 and the 5,000. They're like, all we've got is this, this bread and fish here. But they couldn't see beyond that because... So here's, my, here's the word I got today. Don't limit what you can see based on what you can see. Does that make sense? Don't limit to what God can do, what you can see in your vision, to based upon your resources. Because if you do, guess what? Then he's only going to accomplish what you think he can do in your resources. You're limited. There's a ceiling there. But last time I checked, God doesn't have a ceiling, right? That's why I love that story about the four faithful friends who came in and ripped the ceiling off, right? Let's rip the ceiling off of what God can do. Not look at it based upon do we have enough of this, right? So look at this. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 24 through 34, many of us know these, but I think sometimes we, we, we take things out, not out of context, but we just take one verse and go, look at this. You got to read it in, in the context in which Jesus said it. Because it gives a greater picture. Matthew 6, verse 24, we'll start with. Most people start in 25, but 24, you can see, he's continuing on the same thought. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be loyal to the one, which means he's going to listen to the one, and he's going to despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So what he's saying is, you can't serve God and money, right? Either you're going to listen to God, or you're going to listen to money. And it's not that, so this is sometimes like, see, God doesn't want us to have a bunch of money. No, God doesn't want to ha have money can have control over you. Because whether you got a bunch of money and you're serving it that way, or you got no money and you're serving it that way, you're still serving money. Because my question is, if God wouldn't want you to have money, why do you go to work 40 plus hours a week trying to get it so badly? You're really trying hard to get out of the will of God. But everybody does it, right? So this is, that's a crazy set mindset that we sometimes let, let, let trickle into the church, and it ruins people, and it holds people back from really doing what God wants them to do, okay? So whether you got a bunch of money, and you're serving money that way, or you have no money, because that person's still serving money because they're thinking about it all the time, right? They're still answering questions based upon what they can afford. God doesn't want you thinking that way anymore. Look at this. He continues on, verse 25. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Also, want to point out in that verse, don't think that, like he says, the birds, they don't, need, they don't sow or reap, right? But God provides for them. So don't think, oh, I don't have to sow or eat or sow or reap. No, no, he says you're of more value than they because you get to sow and you get to reap, okay? You are more value than they. Verse 27, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? I like the New Living Translation, makes a little bit more sense to us, says this. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? No, they steal. They take all the time. Take, 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 take. And guess what? There's never enough. Take, 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 take. That's all they do. Verse 28, so why do you worry about clothing? 
Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You can see here everything listed there. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? In today's day and age, all these things cost money, right? He's saying, don't worry about that stuff. Because what that stuff does is when you worry about it, it doesn't add anything to your life. It takes, right? So now you're, you, you, it just it steals more and more and more. And the more you worry about it, the more it steals. And it never ends. It's just this awful, vicious cycle. So God wants to break that cycle and say, no, I'm the provision. I'm the source, right? Because that's what he said. He said, seek first the kingdom of God, and all those things will be added unto you. But how many times do we make decisions based upon finances? I said this last week, right? We limit God based upon what we think we have and that's not what, Jesus said, I don't care. Give me what you got. I can multiply it in, in, ex, abundantly. I can do more than you could do within your hands. If you put it in my hands, I can break the limits off of this thing. And that's where coming faith has, you know, comes in. He even said, he, re, he rebuked them here. He says, oh, you of little faith, right? Faith is really trust, belief, right? So, and I, I just listened to this uh, a message a couple days ago. And it just stirs so strongly in me. Faith works by love, right? That's what the Galatians says. Faith worketh by love. So we think, oh, we got to walk in love to be in faith. That's the aspect of it. But if we recognize that God loves us, man, how much easier is it to have faith in him? How much easier is it to trust him, right? You can trust your parents. He, Jesus even said that. Hey, if you eat, parents being evil can give your children good gifts, how much more your father in heaven? He was always trying to work on the heart motive of the people. Like, can you really trust God? Can you just trust him? Because he's good. He wants good things for you. His love endures forever, right? This is who he is. So if we know that he's going to take care of our sin, which is the biggest aspect we couldn't do ourselves, man, couldn't he take care of our sickness and disease? Can he take care of our finances as well? Absolutely he can. And the reason God doesn't want you worrying about these things is because he says in Mark chapter 4, when he talks about the parable of the story, Jesus says that the cares of this world can choke out the word. It'll choke it out. It'll cut it right off because what you're doing is you're trying to take something that's supernatural and naturalize it. And in the moment you do that, that's the end of it. And that's where it stops. God doesn't want that anymore. You got to think bigger. You got to see bigger. You got to see further. You got to not be limited by anything because you're not limited. You're only limited by how much you think you're limited. Okay? If you start inviting God in this thing, God's like, oh, I could just do so much here. Just give it to me. Let me take care of it. And the thing is, he says here, it's not about the things, right? He says to seek first the kingdom of God. So what I really want to dive into is the motives of our heart, right? Because 1 Samuel 16, verse 7 says this, For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, right? And man looks at the, the things, but the Lord looks at the heart. God sees right through the stuff. He doesn't care about it. He looks right inside, inside to you and goes, I know what's going on in there. No one else does but you and God, okay? It even says in Proverbs that no one else knows the joys and the bitterness of the heart, right? Only you and God know those things. Like my wife, who is the closest human being on this planet that I could ever be to, basically we're one, but she still doesn't even know the deep stuff, right? No one knows that except you and God. And that's where God looks right at and goes, I see what you're doing there. I see it. I see it. Because God's always interested in our hearts, and he's always after our hearts. It's the bottom line. All he ever wanted was your heart to start with. So whether it's, it doesn't matter what it is, finances, anything, it's what he's like, okay, whatever the thing is, move it out of the way and just come to me. Don't worry about it. Just trust me with it. So we see that God is willing to prosper his children, but what motivates us to pursue it? Remember, we, we talked about this. We gotta, it's, that it might happen. So we got to pursue it. How many things in life, like, think about it. Anybody in here married? Men, preferably? Okay, married men. You pursued that woman, right? You had to go after it. It didn't just laissez-faire come to you like, oh, this is great, wonderful. No, 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 you went after it, right? And then that's so amazing because like what happens is you go after the thing you want and you get the thing you want. Not that women are a thing. Don't miss, it's just an illustration here. Women are so much more than a thing. Women are a helpmate. Proverbs says that blesses the man who finds a wife because he finds a good thing. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I could preach about marriage, but we're not talking about marriage today. But 
We need to see this, so we gotta go after those things. But look at this in Genesis chapter 13. I'm gonna read all of Genesis 13, and a little bit of 14, and some of 15, uh, because you need to see it, the full picture here. Genesis 13, and this is just an amazing, amazing uh, illustration of what God can do. Praise the Lord. Genesis 13, verse 1. So this is, we're talking about Abram here. He's not Abraham yet. God didn't change his name yet, but his name is Abram. Then Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him to the south. Abram, look at this. Abram was very rich in livestock. See, there was only rich in goats. No, 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 in silver and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Look at this. Lot also, who went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. Now the land was not able to support them, that they might dwell together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwelt in the land. I'm going to pause there for one minute. Did you just hear what I read there? They had so much stuff that there wasn't enough room for them to, the land couldn't support them because they had so much, so many possessions, right? So, and I also want to point out, it just says Lot was with Abram. This is what happens when you start to truly walk in the prosperity of God. Other people will be blessed just because you're blessed. That's what God said to Abram. I'm going to bless you so you're a blessing to others. Lot was blessed just because he's around Abram. He starts gleaning off of this guy going, wow, he's doing something right. Let me just probably do what he's doing, right? And you could see that. And he get, they get to be so prosperous that their herdsmen start fighting. So they got to separate because like Abram says, it continues on here in verse 10, or in verse 8, excuse me. So Abram says to Lot, please let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we're brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. Uh, if you take to the left, then I'll go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I'll go to the left, right? They got so much stuff. They need to separate because everyone's fighting. He's like, you go this way, I'll go this way, or you go this way, I'll go that way. Your choice. Verse 10. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go towards Zor. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. Verse 14, and the Lord said to Abram, after Lot separated from him, lift your eyes, and not, and, or, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. So, like I said, Abram says a lot, hey, you choose. You go to the left, I'll go to the right, you go to the right, I'll go to the left. It's your choice. It says, Lot looked at the valley and saw that it was well watered, right? He saw that it looked really good. And he goes, you know what? I'm going to go that way. It looks good over there. I, I, I'm, it looks prosperous over there. I'm going to go that way. And Abram's like, sure, go ahead. You go that way. Uh, and I'll go this way. And what happened there was Lot saw the prosperity. He saw what looked to be good, okay? And he went after it. And actually, it even says that Lot went there and pitched his tent, Right? He was so focused on me and mine, I'm going to pinch my house right here because this looks really good. And it says, Abram went the other way, and Abram built an altar, okay? You see the motives of the heart are much different. Lot's looking at what I can get. Abram's looking at how can I serve the Lord. That's the difference in this. And uh, I also want to point out just, and no, I'm not going to point out. We'll, we'll save that for another day. So, and, and, so if you read through Genesis chapter 14, like I said, we're not going to do it for time's sake, uh, Lot gets captured, these kings come in, and they take over Sodom and Gomorrah, and they take all of Lot and his family with them, the whole cities, right? So I want to point out what looks like good is not always God. What looks to be prosperous doesn't necessarily mean God's got his hand on it, right? Yes, God, God always prospers, but not what always prospers is always God. Can we get that? 
So what God always prospers you, but not everything that prospers is God. There's worldly prosperity, and that's what Lot saw here. He saw like, man, this looks really good. I'm going to go after that thing, and he went after it, and guess what? He got captured. So Abram goes, oh, well, i got to go save my nephew now because he's captured, and i got to go, might as well save everybody else too from the city. So he defeats all these kings. Abram and his men come and defeat kings and, and free all these people. And look at this. We're going to pick up that in Genesis 14, verse, I think, uh, 17. Genesis 14, 17. This is what happened. So Abram captures, uh, kill, defeats these kings, gets everybody back, and it says here, And the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley, after his return from the defeat of, I'm going to butcher this name, Chedolamur. Okay, he's dead. So, and the kings who were with him. <laughs> the bad guy. He's the bad guy in this situation. He's gone. Look at this. Verse 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, he was the priest of God Most High, and he blessed him. He blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Look at this. And he, this is Abram, gave him, Melchizedek, the priest of the God Most High, a tithe of all. Right? This is where we see the tithe even before the law. Pastor Steve preaches on this all the time when he said, but yes, we see that. Okay, give him a tithe of the law. Now look at verse 21. Now the king of Sodom, this guy who got captured that Abram just freed, said to Abram, why don't you give me the persons and you take the goods for yourself? Look at Abram's response. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. His hearts, you see again, heart after God, not after, oh, I can get all this stuff. He says, no, 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 God first. Verse 24, except only that the young men have eaten and the portion of the men who went with me, Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre, let them take their portion. He's like, basically, the guys who went with me, let them take their portion. As for me, I'm not gonna take anything because I'm gonna serve God. Lest anybody say, you came in here, the king of Sodom made Abram rich. No, God's the one who makes me rich. Yeah. And look at God's response in verse, Genesis 15, verse one, right? After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. God said he's the exceedingly great reward. Okay, let's break this down. And this I take no credit for. This is uh, in the Hebrew. Exceedingly means swiftly or quickly. Great means an increase. And reward is talking about compensation, wage, wages, or salary. Okay? So God's basically saying to Abram, he would be Abram's quickly increasing compensation, or I'll be your quickly increasing salary, right? He's basically, I'm going to be your provision. You keep seeking me, I'm going to provide all your needs. I'm going to bless you like you wouldn't believe. You got your heart in the right spot, I'm going to keep going with it. Pastor Josh just said it. If God knows he can get something to you and through you, he's going to keep supplying it to you. This is what he's talking about here. But continuing on, look at Abram. Abram's talking, okay, Abram's like, great, that's awesome. But I got bigger things on my mind. Verse 2, but Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me? He's already got a bunch of stuff. Seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abram said, look, you've given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. He's basically saying, this servant of mine, he's going to inherit everything because I don't have a, a son or a child of my own. Verse 4, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir. That servant of yours, he's not going to be your heir. But one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, look now toward heaven. And count the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and he, which is God, accounted it to Abram for righteousness. So you see, Abram's heart was always in the right place. We saw it in Genesis 13, we see it in 14, and then God rewards him in 15. Because Abram passed the money test. The money test. What is the money test? Glad you asked. I know you didn't, but I did. Luke chapter 16. These are things that, this is how we get to know about God, right? We ask God questions. God loves questions. He answers questions. He's not intimidated by a question. He, do, he will answer it. But you got to come to him with the right heart motive. Luke 16. You're going to get there faster than I am. Luke 16, verse 11. Maybe I lied. I'm there faster. I don't know. Luke, verse 11 says, Therefore, if you have not been faithful in, unrighteous, in the unrighteous mammon, which is money, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you've not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? 
No servant can serve two masters. We sound very similar to Matthew chapter 6, right? For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, right? Loyal just means you're going to listen to it. Either you're going to listen to the money or you're going to listen to God. Which one are you going to listen to? But he says here, if you can't be faithful and righteous mammon, who can trust you with true riches? Now, true riches are spiritual things. We, we talk about that. But true riches are also people because people are spiritual things. People are spiritual beings. And that's what he's talking about. I'll be your exceeding great reward. And Amber was like, great, that's awesome. I, I appreciate the provision. But who's going to take over when I'm gone? I want some true riches here. So God says, okay, you pass the money test. Guess what? I'm going to trust you with an heir. I'm going to give you a child, right? That's true riches. These are the things we got to understand. And because I will tell you this, if you start trusting God in your finances, he'll open up doors and start trusting to you true riches. And you know what true riches are? Like I said, they're people. They're going to be people's eternities. God's going to bring them underneath you because you can be responsible with them because he knows this money doesn't have control over you. Because money's got running, money's running the world, guys. If we don't realize that, we're blind to this and we're just naive. No, no, no. The world seeks after money. Money runs economies. Money runs countries, right? It doesn't run the kingdom of God, okay? Obedience and faithfulness to God is what runs the kingdom of God. The love of God, it runs the kingdom of God, right? So God entrusts people in turn to you. God will entrust people's marriages to you. They'll come seeking you because you were faithful in the money thing. Because I'll tell you, if you're married in this place and you guys are faithful in the money thing and you're faithful together, guess what? You guys are going to bring you closer together because money is the number one thing that divides marriages, right? Mammon coming in again, doing what it does, taking and stealing, right? No, 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 no. We don't allow that in the church of God. Husbands and wives, get together on your finances, and I'm, that's my spiel for that. But seriously, because it will unlock things for you. It will unlock things for you. You'll go further than you ever thought you could imagine because you guys are in unity on that. And when there's unity, who, it says in Amos, right, who can walk together unless, or who, what two can walk together unless they are agreed? If you're agreed on money, guess what? Money ain't got no control over your marriage anymore. Tell money to shut up. It don't, you don't serve money. You serve God. God's got, it got, the whole earth belongs to him. It just go, you don't even worry about it no more. I need to break this off of you guys. I, seriously, it feels like I'm plowing a field here. And it's been like this last week. Like, th in this area specifically, I can speak to it because I live in it. We're so bound by lack and poverty. No one can see anything beyond this little bubble that we live in. No, no, no. God wants to do so much more. There are people in this building right now that are called to go to nations that if you don't understand this aspect of it, you'll never go. You're never going to go because you're going to be limited by what you can see. God's breaking off these limitations today. This is why we preach and teach on this thing. It's not so, look at me, I got a fancy car. Who cares about your fancy car? It doesn't matter. Because if you don't have Jesus, you can drive your fancy car off a cliff and you guess where you end up? In hell. And that's nowhere, we don't want that. We want the kingdom of God built. The kingdom of God built. So God will trust you with people's eternities. God will trust you with people's lives because you've been faithful in the money thing. It's the first step of the spiritual ladder. Get that thing done, and you can build right off of that. I will tell you. And what happens is when you do it, it builds momentum. And momentum is an amazing force because once you start going, you can't stop. You're like, this thing's just going to keep rolling and keep rolling and keep rolling, and it will because that's what God does. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Mark chapter 14, everybody. <laughs> Verse 3. I'm going to read this in the Passion Translation. We're going to really look at another aspect of somebody uh, in the money test here. And this is just a reiteration of John chapter 12, but I like Mark's account a little bit better. And it says this, Now Jesus was in Bethany, in the home of Simon, a man Jesus had healed of leprosy. And he was reclining at the table. A woman came into the house with an alabaster flax filled with the highest quality of fragrant and expensive oil. She came to Jesus with a, ge look at this, with a gesture of extreme devotion. She broke the flask and poured it out, the precious oil, all over his head. But some were highly indignant when they saw this, and they complained to one another, saying, what a total waste. Man, it could have been sold for a great sum, and the money could have benefited the poor. So they scolded her harshly. Jesus said to her, leave her alone. Why are you so critical of this woman? She has honored me with this beautiful act of kindness. You will always have the poor, whom you can help whenever you want, but you will not always have me. When she poured the fragrant oil over me, she was preparing my body, in advance from my burial. She has done all that she could to honor me. I promise you that as this wonderful gospel spreads all over the world, the story of her lavish devotion to me will be mentioned in memory of her. I'm gonna pause there. You can see your heart motive is pleasing God, seeking God, right? And I wanna, 
verse, uh, I think it's verse 4. They said, some of the disciples, which is Judas, as we know from the other account, replied, what a total waste. Think about that. She gives this offering to God, and she, he goes, what a waste. But I'll tell you that, the enemy says that every time you give. What a waste. You could have done this and this and that with it. What a waste. Guess what? You know what? There's people out there in this world who go, why are people getting up at 10 o'clock, you know, going to church on Sunday, sitting there for two hours? What a waste of time to worship God. Nothing's ever wasted when you give it to God. You could be here 10 hours a day worshiping God. That ain't no waste. That's multiplication in action. People don't know the spiritual aspects of God. Nothing is ever wasted on the Lord Jesus' account. And actually in Luke's, Luke's uh, account here, it says that this offering was an act of worship, right? It was an act of devotion, an act of worship. And look at this. I'm going to pick up in verse 10 because I never saw this because usually we separate and we stop there. Oh, it's a memory of her. Verse 10. One of the 12 apostles, Judas Iscariot, went to the leading priests to inform them of his willingness to betray Jesus into their hands. They were delighted to hear this and agreed to pay him for it. So immediately, Judas began to look for the right opportunity to betray him. Judas's betrayal came right after this extravagant offering to Jesus. Because that's where sometimes you will make or break people. When something becomes so extravagant, they go, how dare they do anything like that? I could never believe they would do something like that. When can I betray this Lord? When can I betray Jesus? He was so offended at this offering, he sought to betray him so he could get paid for it because he was going to skim off the top of that offering. Don't let that be your heart motive because Judas failed the money test here, big time, because he was always concerned about the prosperity. He was always concerned about me and my own, right? That's not what God wants. God wants the building of the kingdom. You know, there's this great illustration in Luke chapter 12. I'm not going to go there for time's sake, but this guy basically prospers so much, and he goes, hmm, what am I going to do because I have so much stuff? I got an idea. I'm going to build bigger barns, and I'm just going to sit back and kick back and relax, right? And it says that the Lord comes to him and says, fool, now your soul is required of you, right? And who's going to inherit all this stuff you got anyways? Ecclesiastes talks about that. It says it's vanity to go around gathering all these things, because guess what? You're going to, the Lord's going to call you to home, and then someday it's going to go to somebody else, right? So it's not worth pursuing those things. So we miss it if we're doing that. So, and also I want to point out, let's not just think about, because this guy's mindset was, I'm going to have enough for myself, and I'm going to kick back and relax. So when we pursue God, when we ask God for finances, I'm going to encourage you, church, stop asking for just enough for you and your family. That is selfish. That's hard to receive, but that's what religion says. No, 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 we just want enough for us and ours. No, 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 you need more than enough because there's a family down the road that ain't got food tomorrow that you need to go and give them. Why do you think we're doing the Thanksgiving meal giveaway? Don't have that mindset of just enough for me and mine. No, that's a selfish mindset. You're concerned with only yourself and your family. No, think bigger. Think bigger. Don't pursue the big things like cars and houses and stuff like that. No, no, no. Get, go get a bunch of money and just give it all away. That's what God wants because in that, in that instance, you're a kingdom builder. You're a kingdom builder, right? And look at this. I'm going to close with this in Revelation 21, verses 23 through 27. Because it says, you know, in Matthew chapter 6, for where your treasure is, there your heart's going to be also. And this is where this whole series kind of came out of was that scripture. Where your treasure is, there your heart's going to be also, right? What is the motivating factor behind prospering? Because you could see, and I forget who said it, some preacher, probably a thousand preachers at this point, said, if I could spend five minutes with your checkbook, I guess in this case with your online bank account, I could tell you where your heart is, right? Where your money's going, that's where your heart is. Because if it ain't in your heart, you ain't going to spend money on it. Revelation 21, verses 23 through 27, in the Passion says this, the city has no need for the sun or moon to shine, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the lamb. The people will walk by its light, And the kings of the earth will bring their wealth into it. Its gates will never be shut by day, standing always open, because there is no night there. Verse 26. People will bring the glory and wealth of the nations into it. And pause there. People will bring the glory and wealth of the nations into it. It doesn't say they're going to bring the glory and the wealth of heaven into it. It says the glory and the wealth of the nations and actually, just up a little, for verse 24, it says, the kings of the earth will bring their wealth into it. And it says, people are bringing this wealth. People. It doesn't say angels are bringing the wealth. It says people. So who are the people? Glad you asked. Verse 27. Evil will not enter. We know it's not evil people. Right? Because last week we talked about that. Only evil people have money. No, that's not what it says here in Revelation. Continuing on, he says, nor anyone who does what is abhorrent or deceitful, but 
only those whose names are written in the book of the life of the Lamb. The people that are bringing the wealth of the nations into the kingdom of God are the people whose names are written in the book of the life of the Lamb. Me and you, believers, children of God. Because if your book isn't, if your name isn't written in that book, you don't get to enter in. So how can they be bringing stuff into it? They can't. So I encourage you today to endeavor to be a kingdom builder. Be a kingdom builder because there's no greater calling. There's no greater calling. E.W. Kenyon said this. this I was reading a, a book. I think it's called New Creation Realities by E.W. Kenyon. It's a book my wife's reading for Bible college. I just picked it up. I was skimming through some of the highlighted stuff she had in there. And this one hit me like a ton of bricks. And he said in his book, I couldn't fail because I had become the instrument through which the mighty one was working. I couldn't fail because I had become the instrument through which the mighty one was working. So if you're working to build the kingdom, it's never going to fail. You cannot fail. And you want proof to this? 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7 in the Amplified Classic. Put it on the screen, please. It's so good. It's so good. Let each one give as he has made up in his own mind and look at and purposed in his heart. This is why we talk about the heart motive. Not reluctantly or sorrowfully or under compulsion, for God loves, he takes pleasure in, he prizes above other things, look at this, and is unwilling to do or and unwilling to abandon or to do without a cheerful, joyous, prompt to do it giver whose heart is in his giving. God will not abandon you if your heart is in building the kingdom of God. And if you really think about it, this was Jesus' motivation from the time he was on the earth, right? He preached about the kingdom of God, and he always continued to build the kingdom, building the kingdom, building the kingdom, so much so that that's why he went to the cross, was to build the kingdom of God. He didn't go to the cross to be seated at the right hand of God in the heavenly places. That was a byproduct of going to the cross. The, The cross was to redeem you and I, to build the kingdom. And we're called to be imitators of God as dear children. So let Jesus' motivation be your motivation. Not about the things, not about just getting a bunch of money. No, use it to build the kingdom. Take back what the enemy has stolen. Use the resources that the enemy has and he's gripping so tight onto. Rip it out of his hands and use it to build the kingdom of God. Jesus used death to, (laughs) to start the kingdom of God. Jesus took the most powerful weapon that the enemy had right, which is death, hell, and the grave, took it and used it to birth the kingdom of God and his people. So now take the, the power of money, the power of mammon, of unrighteous, unrighteous mammon, of lack of poverty, take that, bring it into God's kingdom and use it to free people to, in the kingdom of God. This is what we do and this is why we do it. But all of that starts with having your name written in the Lamb's book of life. You can't build a kingdom that you don't belong to. So if today is your day, if you have not placed your faith in Jesus, as, in Jesus as your Lord, and you don't know if your name is written in that book of life, today's the day. Don't wait. Don't wait. And the Bible says, it says, don't put off to tomorrow, or not don't put off tomorrow what you can do today. Actually, it does say that. Never mind, it's in Proverbs. Don't put off tomorrow what you can do today. And this is in regards to giving. But don't put off tomorrow what you can do today. Don't put off salvation tomorrow because you can do it today. Today's the day. Today's the day. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, I just encourage you to search your own heart. Search your heart and your motivation for desiring to prosper and know that the desire to prosper is not a bad thing unless it's just to have a bunch of things. Get down deep to the root of that. But also I encourage you to get down deep to the root of is my name really written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Do I know that? Did I place my faith and trust in Jesus Christ? And if you haven't today, I encourage you, to raise your hand, because today's the day of salvation. Praise the Lord. And if that's you, or say you've been walking away from God, you haven't been doing things, God, doing things God's way, but you want to come back into the fold, say, God, I've been doing it my way, but I want to go back doing it your way, because your way is better than mine, and I trust you. You can make a faith or fresh commitment today. And I, not, not everyone has to pray this prayer, but i just give you an example of this. You could just say, Father God, I come to you in the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I believe, Father, with all my heart that you sent Jesus to die for me. Not only did he die for me, but he was uh, buried and he rose again, Father, making me free from everything that could try to hold me back, Father, that I can pursue you and I can run this race, Father God, with endurance, 
Father, I can strip aside every weight, every single snare that's tried to entangle me, whether that be sickness, whether that be poverty, whether that be disease, whether that be sin. It doesn't matter, Father, because you free me from all of it. And I believe it, and I receive it today. Jesus, I confess you as my Lord, and I ask that you take my life and do something with it. Praise the Lord. If that's you and you prayed your, that prayer for the first time today or the second time you recommitted your Lord, we have someone in the next level room in the back of the sanctuary. We want to bless you, pray with you, get you a Bible. Hallelujah. And start you off in this walk the right way. Amen.